So Kevin Rich is also an alumni of Waterloo, having completed his BSc in biology, uh, and then went on to uh, the University of Toronto to do his um, MASc. Um, he is currently, or has been for I guess the past 15 years, at Ducks Unlimited Canada, and he is the provincial policy specialist in Ontario. And I think it's only fitting that being, it, being the last talk of the day, he talks about where do we go from here. Well, not to put any pressure on me. <laughs> and following uh, the keynote speaker, um, I'll have to re remember that the next time I get invited to talk. <laughs> um, maybe not to get that order. Uh, that was a very powerful uh, presentation around our natural wealth, and, and, and I'm going to speak to some of those, um, uh, those, those parts as well. I, and I do apologize. I've, I've come down with a bit of a bug, so if I am sniffly, um, that's what's going on. Um, I, um, my work is in provincial policy, so uh, as much as I'm interested in you know, what's happening in uh, the United States or uh, in other continents, um, my focus is clearly on, on provincial policy. Um, to some degree, we, in, a, in our Ontario team here, uh, we look at sort of the impacts on some federal policy, but by and large, it, the scope of what, what I do um, and our team does is, uh, is around provincial policy. Um, in a nutshell, um, our job uh, and my job is to give government and give industry good reasons to do more to, to conserve wetlands. Giving them reasons to say this is what's in it for your sector or this is what's in it for your ministry uh, to go you know, beyond what the current status is. So today what I'd like to do is try to convince you of two points. First, firstly, that the current policy framework around wetlands needs a thorough review. And that review should include some assessment of how effective policies have been to date, which I will say has been sorely lacking. Second thing I will try to convince you of is that we should also carefully consider a new approach to wetland policy, which some people refer to as a comprehensive wetland policy. And uh, is, uh, is Dr. Rooney still in there? I didn't. Yeah, sorry. So I'll, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm assuming that the Al new Alberta policy would be some would call that a comprehensive wetland policy. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Well, well, I guess we'll, we'll see. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, before I uh, dive right in, um, I have to do the obligatory slides on who we are and what we do in case you haven't uh, uh, been exposed to our work. Um, our work is, is clearly focused on waterfowl and waterfowl habitat. But in, in, as a result of that focus, uh, there's lots of benefits that flow to other wildlife and to certainly to people. Um, our goals uh, in Ontario uh, are to achieve a, a no net loss of wetlands as a step towards achieving net gain over the longer term. We also have a goal of uh, restoring 20% of the wetlands that are already lost. And that, to say the least, is a very ambitious goal. Um, Um, just a little bit of a slide on Ducks, ducks Unlimited by the numbers. Uh, we're very proud to be celebrating 75 years of, of uh, conservation work in, in Canada. Um, not a lot of uh, organizations can make that claim, so we're, we're walking proud these days. Um, 30,000 supporters, 1,200 volunteers, um, 2,500 landowners, and almost a million acres of habitat conserved um, in Ontario. And what does that look like on the land? This is maybe not the best depiction of it. Uh, each one of those tiny duck heads represents a project that was, uh, that was completed uh, through our organization with the first one going back to 1962. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk to you uh, at this point about, I want to start off with three, what I think are three compelling reasons why we need a thorough review of the current policy framework. Um, and, and Faisal spoke to, uh, to uh, the second point, or the, the first point, uh, much better than I could, um, so I won't spend a lot of time on that, except to say, in the last five to ten years, there seems to have been a wave of research that's uh, clarified the economic value of wetlands. And I don't think the policy framework has caught up with all that research and adequately incorporated it into our policies. Um, Secondly, we think, and this is an argument I think to make to the provincial government, is that wetland conservation is a cost-effective way to, to tackle a, no, a number of nagging, sort of uh, difficult issues 
uh, threats to biodiversity, uh, persistent water quality, uh, in particular phosphorus in lakes like Lake Simcoe and, and uh, parts of Erie, and infrastructure renewal. And I'd add to that the, the growing infrastructure deficit. Um, uh, and despite those, um, those good reasons to, to conserve wetlands and keep them on the landscape, um, all indications are that wetland loss persists in terms of area and function. So um, that, that, is a, that is, is, a, is a significant concern. And I'd like to, to just dig in a little bit deeper into the idea of the wetland loss. Faisal spoke to this as well. Um, the most recent research around wetland loss is a study that we uh, completed in 2010, which was an update on some work that Elizabeth Snell of Environment Canada did uh, to update the data uh, for the time period from 1982 to 2002. Um, the bottom line message here is that um, approximately three quarters of wetlands in the southern Ontario have been lost, i.e. converted to other uses, agriculture, residential, infrastructure, what have you, D been paved, drained, what have you. What have you. Um, so the dark, the dark colors on there signify the highest areas of loss. So you've got places like southwestern Ontario, the GTA, the Niagara region, um, and portions of eastern Ontario that have uh, experienced significant losses in some cases well over 90 percent. Um, and this is the other thing to note about this is it's a conservative estimate. Because of the data and the fact that they were trying to replicate a, a previous study, it only looked at wetlands larger than 10 hectares. So, and I was just talking to uh, one of the poster presenters uh, this afternoon about her research in the Prairie Pothole region that basically proved that the smaller the wetland, the higher the risk of, of, of being converted in, in that case to agricultural uses. So I think it's safe to say that the 72% number is a significant under, uh, significantly conservative estimate. Um, so why are we losing wetlands? Um, uh, frankly, as a, um, someone who works in this field, I wish we had, we, we had more definitive data about that. We have some, but I, I think in the interest of developing sound policy and having an evidence-based policy approach that we need more. But the best information that I know of also came from the study that, uh, that we did in 2010, and that pointed to three major causes in the South, being um, urban development, um, infrastructure, and agriculture. And not necessarily in that order, and I suspect that, that the, the, the relative importance of those will change across Southern Ontario. We have, um, or at least I'm not aware of the same kind of research that's been done in the, in the north, um, although we did commission a report uh, to look at wetland threats in, in the near north area, and that uh, re uh, reported back that mining and forestry were likely the most significant causes. Um, but I think there is a, there's a lack of um, solid information there um, to, to base a policy change on. Um, so, I want to just sketch out a little bit, and I apologize that this might be, you know, the, the 101 level of, of policy review for some folks, um, but just to uh, help ensure that there's some a baseline here of uh, an appreciation. Um, in Ontario, um, we tend to think of the preferential policy uh, framework as a bit of a maze, or even a spider web. There's a ton of stuff that impacts, impacts wetlands, either for better or for worse. Um, it's very complicated. Um, so having said that, there are a few pieces of legislation uh, that, that are, are, are probably most relevant to, to wetlands, and those are the three there. You see listed the provincial policy statement, which we hope will be uh, renewed very soon, uh, the Conservation Authorities Act and regulations under that act, and the Far North Act. Um, despite Despite this, you know, fragmented in this sort of spider web approach to wetland policy in Ontario, there has been some good outcomes in, in, from Ontario's policy in terms of wetland conservation, and I want to highlight um, a few of those. This is what's working well, in, in my opinion, in, in Ontario provincial policy. Um, Faisal also spoke to the green belt, and it will help if I advance the slide. Uh, we work with an, a few other NGOs. Um, and released a report a couple of years ago that was all about assessing how well the Greenbelt Plan is working to uh, protect and conserve wetlands. Um, and the findings were, um, were very encouraging. Um, and, and the first one being that by all accounts, and, and we looked at a series of case studies, we did, uh, we did a series of interviews with um, land use planners across the Greenbelt, 
and we did a sort of the legal policy analysis part of it as well. And based on all those pieces, what it told us was, by and large, wetlands in the Green Belt are protected from development, i.e. development that's subject to the Planning Act. That's an important qualifier. Um, which is, which is good news, uh, which is great news. And the, because of the technical criteria the, that in terms of how the Greenbelt Plan is implemented, that effectively means protection of wetlands down to half a hectare in size, so an acre in size, and in some cases protection for smaller wetlands if it meets certain criteria. So that's a significant leap forward. There's no question about it from, from what the policy framework was prior to a Greenbelt Plan. At the same time, th we, we reported that yeah, in, this, uh, in that report that there's certain uses um, that continue to pose threats to wetlands like infrastructure development and aggregate extraction and some existing land uses. And that wasn't an entirely uh, a big surprise to us uh, because I think the, um, the Greenbelt plan was not focused as uh, clearly on uh, addressing those particular threats as it was addressing threats related to Planning Act activities. Um, we hope that, that more research like this will be done to support the 2015 review of the, of the Greenbelt Plan and the Oak Ridges Marine Plan and the Niagara Escarpment Plan. Uh, that's coming up very soon and uh, um, we hope that the province and others will do uh, some analysis and provide some information to inform that review. Um, an another example um, of provincial policy working well, and I should say policy working well because this is, this is a uh, credit and kudos uh, go out to municipalities. Um, since about 2006, Ducks Unlimited has run a municipal extension program, which is all about can, um, engaging with municipalities, giving them information that we think is most relevant to them. Um, so there's a whole slew of wetland values, um, but some are more relevant to what a municipality is concerned about, stormwater management being an obvious one, water quality in their downstream um, systems is another uh, uh, priority. Um, so we've talked to a number of municipalities in that. And in the course of doing that, uh, that work, we've seen a trend in more and more municipalities stepping up, if you like, and going well beyond this, the minimum standard in the provincial policy statement, which um, some of you will know, it only speaks to significant wetlands. Um, uh, and, and, and in areas outside the green belt, what that means in practice is the provincial policy statement really only affords protection to about 40% of the wetlands because the rest haven't been evaluated, so we don't know if they're provincially significant. So that, that's a gap in itself, and that, there's, there's other issues there. Um, so the Gray County is a perfect example. There are others. Uh, City of Kawartha Lakes recently passed an official plan that, uh, that went uh, well beyond what the provincial policy statement. And it's important to, to note that these municipalities weren't obligated to go beyond uh, because they're in the Green Belt. Um, I think part of Kawartha Lakes is in the Green Belt, but they had a blanket-wide um, policy that um, extended protection to uh, uh, many more wetlands. Um, and the other example of, of policy working quite well is uh, reducing barriers to wetland conservation. And um, for people that are maybe not directly involved in, in wetland conservation, uh, you may be surprised that it's, it often takes somewhere between two to four approvals to restore a wetland. Um, and a lot of people around in our company will say, man, this is frustrating. It's, it's, there's less hoops to jump through if you want to, if you want to fill one in. Um, that's obviously much harder to do now, but um, uh, or drain or impact, otherwise impact a well in. It's, uh, it's frustrating uh, from, a, from the perspective of an organization like ours who put a lot of work into restoring wetlands. Um, there's, but those barrier, the good news part, the barriers are coming down. Uh, we recently signed a, um, a pot, an agreement with the Minister of Natural Resources, that was just last week, um, to pilot um, a new pr uh, program for administration of the Lakes and Rivers Improvement Act in a way that would um, expedite um, approvals um, for wetland conservation projects. Um, it's not an exemption by any means. It requires close monitoring and scrutiny. Uh, to make sure that the right projects are, are given the appropriate um, review, um, but we're excited to, uh, to, to, uh, to work on that. Um, the Endangered Species Act regulations, uh, as some of you know, have, have uh, made some changes, and, and our particular interest in those changes was in relation to changes that resulted in um, a, a simpler and, and faster process 
for wetland conservation projects to get approval under the Endangered Species Act. I know other organizations have, have taken issue with, with those changes, but as I say, with, with the focus on, our, our particular interest was in reducing uh, barriers uh, to, uh, to wetland uh, projects by changes in those regulations. Um, the third example of a, of a barrier uh, being removed is a, was a change that the Ministry of Environment made about, um, that's probably five years ago, uh, but we continue to see the benefits of it. Basically, we, uh, conservation projects were given an exemption from the administration fee uh, attached to a permit to take water. Um, it also might surprise a lot of people that a typical wetland restoration project that results in holding any water back um, is sort of captured under the permit to take water program. Um, so. Um, we were very pleased that the province had made some changes there and that had made significant cost savings and um, time savings for staff in uh, seeking those approvals. So I'll flip the side here and, and flip the coin here a little bit and wh where can we improve? Um, this, is, this is a very interesting case study. Um, and. Um, so how many, how many of you heard of St. Clair National Wildlife Area or St. Luke's Marsh? Okay, yeah, that's cool. So um, this is, oops, that's got that issue. This is, and if I can get my big thumbs on, this is the St. Clair National Wildlife Area, this is the St. Luke's Marsh, and this is the now former Triangle Marsh. Uh, St. Luke's Marsh is about 224 hectares. It's uh, primarily all provincially significant wetland. Uh, in terms of waterfowl value, it has continental significance. Um, uh, the adjacent National Wildlife Area has been designated as a Ramsar site. Um, not sure why they didn't extend that designation over to St. Luke's, uh, but um, regardless, uh, a lot of the features and functions of those two are very similar. Um, and and when we, we're fairly certain that there's a number of species at risk that are inhabiting St. Luke's Marsh. King Rail, for example, has been cited on numerous occasions in the National Wildlife Area. There's only a ditch that separates the two. It's a pretty safe bet that some critters like that and others that are uh, threatened or endangered are living in St. Luke's Marsh. So um, we think, uh, so right now St. Luke's Marsh is, is up for sale for $4 million. And based on what happened here at the Triangle Marsh, and I just showed you what that, that, that site looked like. So this is Triangle Marsh in a, as a managed wetland in 20, 2004. This is what it looked like four years later, drained and growing organic tomatoes. Um, based on that conversion and another conversion not far away in a marsh called Winterline, we think there's a real significant risk that St. Luke's Marsh is going to be sold and converted, quite possibly to agriculture. And uh, you know, when I, when I have this discussion with, with different people, um, they have a reaction which is similar to uh, what my son's reaction is when I, when I give him a piece of information. He's a, he's a little guy and he, he often, he's, he's totally gobsmacked about something and he'll say, what the truck, daddy? And we, we, used, to, we used to have a t-shirt and, and he just started growing it and it says, what the, and then it's a truck underneath it. And so that's his standard. And we say, what the truck? And it's exactly, and that's much better than him saying the more common version of the expression. <laughs> So, but that, that's the general reaction. Um, how can this happen? It's got all these things, provincially significant, globally significant for certain um, uh, animals, uh, a Ramsar site next door. Um, how can this happen? There's already been 98.5%, I think, loss in Chatham-Kent, which is in the upper tier municipality there. Um, so, um, obviously we think that's a significant gap that needs to, address, to, to be addressed. <laughs> Um, switching over to um, another area of improvement is uh, the case of uh, um, the growth plan in the Places to Grow Act. Um, and, and some of you will know this uh, case study way better than I because uh, it's the Regional, Municipal, Regional Municipality of Waterloo's official plan which was recently overruled by uh, Ontario Municipal Board uh, ruling which basically threw out the, uh, the region's um, land budgeting exercise in which had the result, the net, the net result of that was instead of uh, 85 hectares uh, being um, used for greenfield development, the, uh, um, 
the, the OMB's ruling resulted in over 1,000 hectares uh, being uh, used for greenfield development. Um, yeah, so critics of, this, of, of that OMB decision have rightly said what the OMB had, has done there is, is equivalent to rewriting provincial policy. So I think the question has to be asked is, is that, first off, is that an efficient, cost-effective way to implement land use policy, appealing these things to a quasi-judicial board? And then secondly, why is the OMB allowed, in effect, to rewrite uh, provincial land use policy? And, and we are temp temp temporarily offline. I hope it's temporary. Sorry. Thanks, Christina. Um, Faisal also spoke to the, the Nepis Foundation review. Uh, basically, it said um, if, if, if sort of the plan continues as it is, uh, with, with uh, not all municipalities fully implementing, i.e. not all municipalities adopting those targets for intensification and greenfield density, um, it will not reach this goal of reducing land consumption. Um, so there needs to be a stronger commitment municipally and provincially around implementing that and follow the, following the spirit and intent of the growth plan. Are we at 10 minutes? Well, okay. Um, so um, I'm going to switch gears. I hope I've given you a, re a reason enough to, to think about the need for a comprehensive, or a, for the need for a, a significant policy review, um, if you didn't already think there was a need. And now I'm going to talk to you about uh, another approach that uh, we think should be seriously looked at, and that's a comprehensive wetland policy. Um, what is that? Um, it starts at a pretty high level document that talks about vision and outcomes, but it's also built around this full recognition of wetland benefits. So taking into account all the, the new science, the new information that we've, we've gleaned as a society over the last five to ten years, and bringing that into the policy to say there are strong environmental and economic reasons to, to value wetlands and, and uh, minimize their um, their loss. Um, the uh, shared, um, one of the other important elements of a, of a comprehensive wetland policy, we think, is this notion of a shared vision. I don't think it's, a, it's fair to, to look at government or any other one sector and say, okay, you guys solved it, solved the problem. You come up with a solution that's going to meet, you know, the needs of Ontarians. This needs to be a full um, consultation with government, non-government, the public, the whole lot. Anyone basically who has a, an interest in wetlands. Um, high level objectives could speak to, you know, wetland protection and restoration. And, and we think the adaptive management part is really important as well. As I said, there's been some missed opportunities um, lately with um, not having enough uh, data to look at the, how effective the 20, uh, 2005 provincial policy statement was. There was a framework put in place, but there was no actual analysis of data to say, using these kind of parameters, uh, this policy is working and this one is uh, struggling and so forth. That, hasn't, that wasn't done for the PPS review, and we hope that that would happen um, in subsequent reviews. Um, so one of the other elements that we think could be part of a, part of a comprehensive wetland policy is this overarching goal of no net loss as a, as a, as a first step uh, to potentially a net gain. Um, and in, order, in, our, in our opinion, in order to, to really make a no net loss policy work, you need to use this um, mitigation sequence, this hierarchy, and uh, Dr. Rooney spoke to that. Um, it, the, the premise being the first priority in all cases is avoidance. Only when you can't get there, it's minimization. And only when minimization is inadequate can you skip to, to compensation. Having said that, there is there's some science to say the first two steps get skipped over because it's, well, if you're a developer, that's, it's, uh, it's a faster process. It's going get to you, get your uh, houses on the ground faster. Um, the, other, the other important element is this idea that um, a, a comprehensive wetland policy, in our, in our opinion, should include all aspects of wetland conservation, not just policy tools, but stewardship initiatives, education and communication initiatives, and research and monitoring. The whole gamut of things, of activities, that uh, need to be done to, um, to conserve wetlands. Um, so um, where do we go? How, how can we get there? Um, this is a this is a gr grossly simplified process for how we could get there, and I'm sure the people in the, that worked for the Alberta government 
if you asked them what their process looked, they would, they would scoff and say, well, that's, you haven't scratched the surface because it was 10 years in the making, I think, from the interim wetland policy to the, to the new one that was released last fall. Um, but I think what, what we'd like to, to emphasize is that the consultation with all sectors that have an interest is going to be critical um, and that, that an, a, a crucial milestone uh, would be a draft comprehensive wetland policy developed um, and then moving into support from a broader um, audience including the public and, and, and ending in government approval. And we're not uh, uh, naive at all to think that this is going to happen uh, soon. I think, you know, there's so many variables here, politics not being the least of those, and uh, what type of government we have uh, in the years ahead. Um, but um, it's important to, we think it's important to move down that road. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. And I'll just wrap up uh, by saying um, the, the two points that I, that I have, hopefully I've, I've given you reason to, to, to think about and, and to, uh, um, agree on is that there is, there is a clear need for um, a, a significant policy review and that we should also look at a comprehensive wetland type of policy along the lines of what um, jurisdictions like Alberta and Nova Scotia and New Brunswick have, have adopted um, and, and cons give serious consider consideration to that as an approach to use in Ontario. We're, we're very pleased we signed a, an MOU with the Ministry of Natural Resources last year, a 15-year MOU, to, to sort of maybe formalize our, our partnership. And one of the priority actions under that was, was a commitment by the province to, to agree to do a policy review. So, so that they've gone on record as saying, yes, we think there's value to doing that. Um, and so we're looking forward to working with the province on, on advancing that. Um, I think that's Thank you. Kevin, thanks for your presentation. The, uh, uh, you and the previous speaker mentioned the Green Belt, and I wanted to comment on that. It seems to be very much a Toronto-centric uh, development that it's, maybe development's not the right word, but I think it is. And it, it seems to protect a chunk of Ontario, but once you're outside that boundary, it in fact has a cost. Uh, I live in the east end of Brant County and the developers that used to pick on Ancaster are now pu picking on East Brant and then it's going to be West Brant and then it's going to be Elgin County and just moving right across the province. It doesn't do a thing for Windsor or Thunder Bay or Brantford to protect the Toronto good, I'm afraid. But yeah. I, I would agree that there, that, that it does increase the, the risk of, of loss on the other side of the Green Belt line. Um, so, and that's all the more reason why the Greater, greater Golden Horseshoe Growth Plan needs to be fully implemented and the government, the provincial and municipalities need to commit to making that happen. Yeah. If I could just concur, he's right. Um, we did a satellite analysis looking at land use change inside and outside the Green Belt and the conversion of natural capital outside of the Green Belt is significant. Um, I think there's a couple of things that are important to know. Uh, one you've mentioned, which is critical, which is that we need to implement the growth plan uh, because that's going to minimize greenfield development if it's implemented. The other one is that you can grow the green belt, but the problem is, is the provinces deferred that authority to the municipalities and that there's a bunch of criteria that municipalities have to meet, one of them being that the, the, the land has to be adjacent to the existing green belt that effectively precludes communities coming forward with their own vision of protecting farmland or nature in the form of food belts or green belts or such. Um, but we have seen some growth of the green belt that has happened and there are municipalities like Mississauga right now that are looking at green belting the ravine system uh, that flows along the Credit Valley. Uh, but I totally agree with you. I, I think we need pervasive policy change so as to avoid that that loss of nature. Can't just rely on the green belt. Yep, yeah, yeah. agreed. So I think that's all the time we have for questions. We'd like to thank all of our speakers from today. Um, we had a great diverse group and I know I learned a lot. And thank you for giving of your time and thank you for everyone that attended. 
Um, from here, we're going to go on to our panel discussion, which is going to begin in about a minute. So if you could just sit tight. We can have our panel members come down. And after the panel at 4 o'clock, we're going to have our poster session and reception. So for those of you that are judges, um, if you can meet in the fishbowl at 4 o'clock. Thank you.